Well, good morning, everyone. Mrs. Hansen here, ready to begin a next step journey with you in chapter eight. This topic is devoted to addition reactions of alkenes, looking at a double bond and adding something across. So the focus here, of course, is looking at that pi bond as a nucleophile, this very electron rich area can act as a nucleophile. And so with this, we're adding across the double bond. In our first few sections are really introductory topics. Let's talk about addition reactions and what are those things that can add across the double bond going back to create a saturated hydrocarbon. In your second section, I'll invite you into your text to read about important alkenes in nature and in industry as well. In the third section, we'll talk about thermodynamics in terms of addition versus elimination because they are indeed opposite equations, right? They're just the forward and reverse. So if I were to take an equilibrium arrow and just say, if we add across the double bond, creating all four sigma bonds on the carbon, we're going to add across the X and the Y. Well, that can clearly see that that is entropy is decreasing, so it's unfavorable. You can see that because we're taking two molecules and creating just one. So an unfavorable entropy has to be overcome with enthalpy. And in that section, we'll talk about how we can control addition versus elimination really by controlling the temperature in which we run the reaction at. So that's our thermodynamics talk little bit of review from our chapter six. Then we get into some examples of alkene reactions with hydrohalogenation, hydrohalogenation, adding an HX across the double bond. And we'll learn how to predict where the hydrogen will add and where the halogen will add across that double bond. In the next three sections, acid catalyzed hydration, oxymercuration and demercuration, along with hydroboration oxidation. All of these three mechanisms will be studied, adding an HOH across the double bond, thus the term hydration. So you can see adding water across the double bond, thinking water is HOH, you're turning your double bond into an alcohol functional group. All three of those processes have a little different outcome. So if you'd like to control where the hydroxyl group will land, we'll need to look at all three mechanisms. In section eight, we talk about catalytic hydration, hydrogenation. Hydrogenation is adding H2. So across the double bond, you'll add an H and an H to each side. Now, depending upon the catalyst, we can see a syn addition. That will mean the same side of the double bond. We'll look at metals such as palladium, platinum, nickel serving as a catalyst. And we'll also look at Wilkinson's catalyst. Halogenation and halohydrin formation is the ninth section. Let's say, for example, I add a bromine or a chlorine, one to each side of the double bond. That's a halogenation reaction. If I add a halo hydrin formation into one side of the double bond will go a halogen and the other side will go an alcohol. And that's just controlling the solvent that we use. Anti dihydroxylation and syn dihydroxylation. Dihydroxylation just simply means adding two OH groups across the double bond. If you'd like them to add syn versus anti. And if you think about what those two terms mean, just to kind of preview that, if the double bond, well, let me just redraw that. The double bond here has a syn or an anti addition. You're just really thinking about on what sides they would be involved in adding. So we know that a carbon to carbon would have a dash and a wedge. If they add on the same side, we'll look at that as sin. And if they add in the opposite side, you'll look at that as saying that is 
and anti. So what can we do to control the way that we're adding across those hydroxyl groups? A dihydroxylation, so these are both OHs. When we get this far, we're adding two OH groups. And then in this 12th section, the oxidation cleavage. We use such a strong oxidizing agent that we actually break the double bond and form carbonyl groups in its place. So the term cleavage there means breaking the bond. And I'll write that as ene, breaking the double bond. That's an oxidative cleavage. And then the last two sections are really applications, putting it all together, predicting the products of any addition reaction and synthesis strategies, one-step and even two-step synthesis strategies, giving you a starting material and asking you to create something, or a retrosynthesis in which you're giving, let me write that, retrosynthesis, in which you're given a final product and have to figure working backwards how to make it. And that really is an important section to lay the strong foundation for chapter 11 upcoming soon, which is literally called synthesis, which makes us remember everything we've learned so far in the class. So a good solid foundation in the last part of this chapter will be helpful once you get to chapter 11. So I've done a great job previewing all the different kinds of addition reactions and really have described these learning outcomes as I did so. You'll define the addition reaction, and we'll learn there's five kinds of addition. And just really, what are you adding across the double bond makes those types of additions. Are you adding a hydrogen molecule? Are you adding a hydrogen halogen? Are you adding an HOH? Are you adding two halogens? All of these things kind of help us figure out what type of re addition reactions we'll list. And we'll look at five different things as we add across the double bond. And they all have just a little different name based on the thing that you're adding. You'll describe the role of temperature in determining whether an addition or elimination will occur. And I can tell you that's nothing more than an application of Le Chatelier when we get to our thermodynamic section. Hydrohalogenation describing the reaction in terms of regiochemistry and the effects of peroxides. Those peroxides are those double oxygen groups. Describe an acid catalyzed hydration, HOH, think hydration is just water, and including the reactants, intermediates, products, and every one. We're gonna study regiochemistry, which means where do the things add across the double bond? which side goes where, and then the stereochemistry, if we're looking at chirality, if our addition reaction produces a chiral center, we have to determine which direction the chirality will occur. We'll discuss hydration of an alkene by oxymercuration, demercuration, which prevents rearrangement. We'll talk about anti-Markovnikov addition of water by hydroboration oxidation. If we talk about anti-Markovnikov, we'll also talk about Markovnikov addition right in our very next section. And then again, just down here, what is the difference between your syn additions and your anti-additions? The catalytic hydrogenation, that's with our metal catalyst via syn addition, or a syn dihydroxylation. This ozone alysis, ozone, that molecule O3, which is in resonance, so we can see that it would have an alternating double bond, single bond. This ozone molecule actually is such a strong oxidizing agent, you'll see that it actually cleaves the alkene. So our C double bond C, as we mentioned, actually gets cut right there, it cleaves. What are those factors that must be considered in the outcome of an addition reaction? Well, we talked about the reagent, that is there an intermediate? We talked about regioselectivity. We talked about stereochemistry. All of those things must be considered when we decide what products are most likely to come out. And then all of the mechanisms for changing the positions of a leaving group or pi bond. These are those synthesis strategies in the last section. Tell me what reagents are necessary to change the carbon skeleton of a molecule and using those mechanisms will help you predict how to change that carbon skeleton as well. 
So yes, friends, this is quite a meaty chapter, and let's dive in. Section one, let's introduce an addition reaction. We know that addition is the opposite of elimination. So when we have an addition reaction, we start with a pi bond. This is the alkene, where you know that this is an sp2 hybridized carbon. These two carbons in the double bond are the focus of where we add the X and the Y. So an addition reaction breaks the pi bond and forms new sigma bonds so that the carbons turn into sp3 hybridized alkanes. So we're breaking a pi bond and forming two sigma bonds. The addition reaction is the opposite of an elimination reaction, which we studied last chapter. Both E1 and E2 were elimination reactions. And these versatility of alkenes are directly attributed to that reactivity of the pi bond. So remember, if we're using an acid, HA would represent a proton, H, connected to its conjugate base, A negative. The alkene pi bond can act as a base and abstract a proton. So this arrow represents proton transfer, one of the four types of arrows learned from chapter six. And in this example, do you see how we have a carbocation form? And every time we have a carbocation, I want you to just remember that they have the ability to rearrange. If they can form a more stable carbocation, they do so. And you will see kind of a mixture of products based on rearrangement possibilities. Unless we control that, and we can with certain reagents. If the pi bond in the alkene is acting as a nucleophile, it reaches out for an electrophile. And so just remember the name of this type of arrow would be called a nucleophilic attack. So whatever this electrophile might be, will add across the double bond. And notice in this particular step, we still have a carbocation intermediate. So think possible rearrangements, unless we control that with a very selective reagent. So selecting what you put on top of the arrow here really matters if you'd like to have prevention of rearrangement. So these are the types of reactions. As we think about common types of addition reactions, just hearing their name kind of puts it into consideration of what you're adding. So hydrohalogenation, hydro from hydrogen, halogenation simply means adding a halogen. So adding HX across the double bond, that will be one of the very first addition reactions we study in section 8.4. The addition of water, HOH, hydration, HOH. We look at actually three different types of hydration reactions based on the selection of your um, reagents, adding HOH. We could have that with anti, with syn addition, all kinds of choices. The next would be adding hydrogen, hydrogenation, adding H2 across the double bond. There we don't necessarily have to consider regiochemistry because we're adding the identical atom across the double bond. Same thing here, we have an X where you could be adding chlorine or bromine. Since we're adding the same atom across the double bond, we don't really need to consider regiochemistry. Halohydrin, halohydrin, halogen for halo and then the hydrogen. So here you have a hydroxyl group and some halogen. It could be chlorine, bromine, or even iodine. And dihydroxylation, adding two groups of OH, studied back in, chapter, in sections 10 and 11. So all of these things, one section at a time, will be studied. We have to remember the mechanism. And that's really what I want to emphasize, is to promote you from memorizing reagents and their outcomes, work to understand its mechanism so that you can apply these in future chapters. If your approach to organic chemistry is to memorize, it will not work or it will not work well. 
especially when you start getting into higher chapters where you need to apply the mechanisms based on selecting a reagent. So let's dive in. We mentioned that addition and elimination reactions are opposite. Here we have the pi bond and an HX. Notice the HX, I can just separate this in terms of a bond between them. We could see that the pi bond reaches out for this proton and this bond would collapse. So in this first step, we would have a proton transfer. This X negative then, just thinking about it now becomes the nucleophile and would go back to attach to the second carbon. So you can see the H and the X have added across the double bond. An addition reaction in the forward direction. Well, the addition reaction is an exothermic process. So notice how I'm writing heat as a product. Heat comes out of the reaction. Now I notice what you're thinking here about entropy. We have two moles of reactants and only one mole of product. So it is entropy unfavored, right? The entropy is decreasing. So therefore this heat must be so great to overcome the decreasing entropy to still drive the reaction forward. Remember that delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. Here is the enthalpy of reaction. This must be so negative to be overcoming a negative entropy and still make the delta G spontaneous. So it is a very exothermic reaction. In the reversed reaction, elimination then is endothermic. It requires heat. So think about Le Chatelier's principle. And if you remember Le Chatelier saying, when we have a system that's in equilibrium and you apply a stress to that system, the system is just going to counteract that to alleviate the stress. And so thinking about heat as a stress and applying Le Chatelier's principle, let's suppose I just take heat and I raise it. So this is the stress right here, is increasing heat. Le Chatelier says, I want to do the opposite to alleviate the stress. And alleviating the stress is I'm going to shift away to use up the excess heat. Adding heat shifted the equilibrium left. And what's being favored? Well, that's elimination. So at high temperatures, elimination is being favored based on Le Chatelier's principle. You're driving it in the reverse direction. Well, what about in a second situation, applying Le Chatelier's principle, and let's decrease the heat. So now the stress is lowering heat. Le Chatelier says, I want to overcome the disturbance. And the opposite of less heat is more heat. So your reaction will now push to the right to create more heat. So lowering heat favors the forward direction, which is the addition. So Le Chatelier's principle, just remembering that addition is exothermic and we can predict high and low temperatures. And let's just prove that to you that breaking a pi bond and forming sigma bonds from it is truly an exothermic process. So back in our previous chapter six, we had a table that gave us bond enthalpy values. And no, you will not be calculating those in this chapter, but just to kind of verify why we know it's exothermic in the addition direction. When we look up ethene, just a two carbon double bond, <clears throat> the amount of energy needed to break that bond we looked up from our table at 63 kcals per mole. Breaking a sigma bond in an HCl is 103 kcals per mole. So here is the sum of the reactants, which we know break bonds. 
And over here, we can sum the two bonds that we formed, which were both sigma bonds, a carbon to hydrogen at 101 kcal, a carbon to chlorine at 84 kcals, and so here is the sum of the products. And we know that that formula says bond broke minus bonds form, and we come up with negative, which is an exothermic value. So seeing that it's exothermic, just remember it this way. In the addition direction, being exothermic, and those two are reversed from each other, the heat is on the product side. Increasing heat, we favor addition. Let's begin looking at our next section, adding an HX across the pi bond, hydrohalogenation. So notice we're controlling the temperature, and you can see that we have this temperature low so that we're driving the reaction forward. The addition reaction, I want us to find the two carbons that are in the double bond, and you'll notice that one of them has received a hydrogen and the other has received the bromine. When we have a symmetrical alkene, which we do here, and what I mean by symmetrical, that I have the two carbons attached to identical groups. So this molecule would be 3-hexene, and just to help us remember, this would be the same side, Z3-hexene or cis. Either word is good. But we're saying that because it's directly in the center of a six carbon chain, it is a symmetrical alkene. And so it really did not matter which side of the carbon in the double bond got the H and the Br. In other words, if we just kind of review that, if the Br ended here and the H ended there, these are the same compound. When that happens with a symmetrical alkene, we do not have to consider regiochemistry. In other words, we don't care which side the H goes to and which side the Br goes to because you're going to make the same molecule regardless. But what if we started with an unsymmetrical alkene and here's an example of such. We have one, two, three, four carbon chain. At carbon two, we have a methyl group. At carbon two is the double bond of a four carbon chain. So two methyl, two butene is not a symmetrical alkene. So now it really does matter where does the X go? Where does the hydrogen go? And we study the positions, the regioselectivity of hydrohalogenation through the work of a Russian chemist, Vladimir Markovnikov. And yes, we have to say that word quite a bit. His last name is the rule to help guide us in deciding where does the halogen land. When he was studying these regioselective reactions, he noticed that the addition of a hydrogen generally installed at the vanillic position already bearing the larger number of hydrogen atoms. Let's say that again. In this example, here is your alkene between carbon two and three. In the location of the two carbon double bonds, here we know that this has a hydrogen. At carbon three, there is a hydrogen. And at carbon two, there is no hydrogen. So when we form the product, the hydrogen goes to the carbon that has more hydrogen. And where that ended up, and just kind of thinking about where the new one would land, it would land on the carbon that had more hydrogen, meaning that the halogen would end up on the carbon with less hydrogen. That's how I remember Markovnikov's rule. The halogen is generally installed at the more substituted position. And we will understand why when we look at the mechanism. And the mechanism all about a carbocation intermediate. Wanting to form the most stable carbocation, meaning that it has to be on the carbon that is most substituted for the positive charge. 
So the research that he did allowed us to predict where the halogen adds. In this example, the hydrogen adds to the carbon with more hydrogen and the bromine landed on the carbon with no hydrogen. What we noticed when the, his peers tried to duplicate, replicate his uh, research, they were running into some uh, issues where they could not duplicate it with confidence 100% of the time. So it concluded that pure reagents were needed to follow the rule. When impure reagents were used, those that contained alkyl peroxides went into an anti-Markovnikov addition. When we say anti-Markovnikov, the hydrogen goes to the carbon that is most substituted and the halogen goes to the carbon that is least substituted. That's the opposite of what we had just practiced. So if I'm looking at this particular compound, an anti-Markovnikov, the halogen would land at the least substituted carbon. There, the anti-Markovnikov, the halogen at least substituted carbon. And if you're looking at Markovnikov's rule, the halogen is installed at the more substituted position. So the moral of this story is be very careful in looking. If there is an ROOR, that's what we're going to call an alkyl peroxide. And yes, we will look at that mechanism after we look at the Markovnikov addition, we'll look at the alkyl peroxide mechanism a little bit later. The alkyl peroxide, the double O's in here, let you know that it's going to be an anti-Markovnikov addition. And if you just see HBr written on the arrow by itself, think of this as a pure reagent, and therefore it will follow the Markovnikov's addition. So at this point, really without understanding mechanism just yet, I want us to get familiar with how the arrows will look. Here I have an alkene and a pure reagent sitting on the arrow, just HBr. Expect a Markovnikov's addition. The halogen lands on most substituted carbon. Now, I want you to notice in the second pathway, you have an alkyl peroxide. And I want you to just think that is an impure reagent, and therefore it's going to have the anti-Markovnikov addition, which tells us the halogen lands on least substituted carbon. And if they're the same substitution, it absolutely doesn't matter which carbon it lands on. It's a symmetrical molecule. So how about trying those? Why don't you pause the video and give yourself some think time? Draw these in your notes. Draw the expected major product for each of the following reactions. Asking yourself, where does the H land? Where does the BR land in each of these synthesis, one-step synthesis reactions? Come back to me when you're ready to check. Okay, welcome back. In your letter A, you can see that this was a pure reagent, so we will expect to follow the Markovnikov's addition. We have one, two, three, four, five in that compound. Just to practice naming, that would be three methyl. And then at carbon two of a five carbon chain, we have a double bond, three methyl to pentene. When I look at the position, this carbon is the most substituted carbon in the double bond. So it will receive the BR. And we would just write that as the addition product of a Markovnikov addition. The, the bromine landed on the carbon with the most branches, the most substituted. But now I'm noticing an alkyl halide which means it's an impure reagent. 
means it's going to be an anti-Markovnikov addition. So with our cyclopentane and the double bond now saturated, the bromine ended at the least substituted carbon in the double bond. Down below, here is the most substituted carbon in the double bond, and we would see our bromine add here in a Markovnikov addition. So we're just practicing recognizing the importance of purity to follow Markovnikov in a hydrohalogenation or an anti-Markovnikov with an impure reagent in the presence of that alkyl, I'm sorry, alkyl peroxide. I'm glad I noticed that before I turned the page. I'm sure you're going, oh lady, what are you writing? But it's an alkyl peroxide. Identify the reagents, kind of an opposite problem you would use to achieve the following transformations. I'm going to ask for you to pause this now, give yourself think time, and come back in a moment when ready to check. All right, here we can see the two carbons in the double bond, noticing that the carbon that was most substituted received the halogen. So this we need to recognize as Markovnikov's rule. Therefore, we know that we added HBr as a pure reagent. In the second example, here we had the two carbons in the double bond. The least substituted received the halogen which you need to recognize as an anti-Markovnikov addition. So sitting on the arrow would be your HBr in addition to the alkyl peroxide, making it the anti-Markovnikov mechanism. Good work. Let's dive into that mechanism for the Markovnikov addition of a hydrohalogenation. The alkene in step one of our mechanism undergoes a proton transfer. So this pi bond is being used as a base, right? The, that is acid-base chemistry. When the alkene acts as a base, notice that the arrow is originating from the rich pi bond and it's proton plucking off right here, forcing this bond to collapse. And when it does so, it forms the anion of bromide, which will come back to us in a moment. So a proton transfer where the alkene acts as a base, steals the H from the HBr, and now we have a carbocation intermediate. And that will be talked about at length, carbocation intermediate. Knowing that we have an electron deficient carbon, that's an sp2 hybridized carbon, electron deficient, it bears a positive charge. This bromide is now going to act as a nucleophile. And so the arrow originates at the nucleophile and it comes down to the carbocation, the electron deficient carbon. So this arrow is a nucleophilic attack. And we have then added across the double bond, both H and Br. Now let's think about the Y. Remember that carbocation stability is going to dominate the reason why H adds to the least substituted, the bromine adds to the most substituted. In this intermediate, where the H added, we created right here a tertiary carbocation. And we know that that is the most stable conformation, the most stable configuration of a carbocation, that we increase the stability with the more substituted carbocations. If we had placed the hydrogen on the other, and again, just to redraw, if I had placed the hydrogen here, and put the positive sign here, and if I made that the carbocation, we would only have a secondary carbocation. That is less stable 
than a tertiary carbocation. So you can see why the hydrogen adds to the carbon that has the most hydrogen. The reason is, is to create the most stable configuration of your intermediate carbocation. You wanna put the positive charge on the most substituted carbon. I'm gonna write that because it's so important. Put the positive charge on the most substituted carbon. And that's going to help you predict and understand Markovnikov's rule. In this intermediate that forms, the positive charge has to be placed on the carbon in the double bond that has the most carbon attached, and that's to help stabilize the carbocation intermediate. Then in the next step, the bromide, or whatever the halogen might be, fills that deficient carbon's fourth bond. You can see that the proton transfer is the rate determining step. It has the highest activation energy in your thermodynamics coordinate. The activation energy for proton transfer is of higher amount than the activation energy for the nucleophilic attack. So you see that the proton transfer is the first step in the mechanism and it will be the rate determining step. Let's practice this, drawing a mechanism. We have a compound, one, two, three, four, five, six. Double bond gets priority and we wanna make sure that it has the lowest number. So this would be 2-methyl cyclohexane. Notice I did not have to give you a locant for the double bond because you know it will always originate at carbon 1. And I know this is just a little diversion, but why didn't I number the other way? If the double bond originates at carbon one, as one cyclohexene, and I'm doing that on purpose, which one is the correct way to order? I'm just forcing us to review earlier chapters. And of, co of course, you're telling me I need to have the methyl group at the lowest possible number. So. 2-methyl cyclohexene is ruled out because 1-methyl cyclohexene has that substituent branch at the lowest number possible, still giving the priority to carbon 1 and 2 for the double bonds. So I just wanted to remind you, just a little extra practice. We'll take it off the screen. The focus here is drawing the mechanism. So remember, in step one, we need to use two arrows, two curved arrows. We're gonna protonate the alkene. So I'm going to just start with redrawing. Here's our alkene, and the double bond here is going to act as a base because it's going to have a proton transfer. The arrow reaches out from the pi bond and it abstracts the proton, this bond collapses. So we need two curved arrows in step one. It is a proton transfer. And at this point, we have a carbocation intermediate. So where should the, and let's just emphasize, where should the positive go? So notice here and here, those are the vanillic positions, those carbons are in the double bond. We want the positive charge to be on the most substituted carbon. And so you wanna make the most substituted carbocation. Now that means in this first step where the hydrogen added, we don't have to show you, but it's right here. That's where the hydrogen added, leaving the carbon as a tertiary carbocation. Had we drawn it in the other direction, just to emphasize, had we placed it here, that's only a secondary carbocation, 
and that is not as stable as a tertiary carbocation. So always make sure to put the positive sign for your carbocation on the carbon that's most substituted from the double bond. And now in our next step, we come back for a nucleophilic attack. The chloride that was generated here now acts as the nucleophile. And just remember, it's electron rich, right? That's the chloride negative ion. So in this next step, in the double arrow, the chloride reaching out for the carbocation positive charge. And here we would have our product. There's still the methyl group, and now here's the chlorine. This is not a chiral center. And so we don't need to consider just yet the stereochemistry, but we will when we make stereocenters. We have to decide about chirality. Right now, we're getting the mechanism emphasizing the carbocation intermediate, noticing that this is an sp2 hybridized carbon, meaning it's electron deficient. It carbon only has three bonds and it needs to have four. We just drew the mechanism of adding HCl across the double bond, emphasizing the importance of creating a stable carbocation intermediate. Make it a tertiary if possible. How about you try one on your own now? Draw a mechanism for the following transformation. Pause your video, work it out, and come back when you're ready to check. All right, let's go to work. We had a six-membered ring with a double bond coming off of the corner here. And I want to just emphasize to show the arrow, I have to separate the H and the BR. I need to have a bond there. And so the pi bond originates for a proton transfer, making this bond collapse. We must have two arrows in the first step for a proton transfer. The result coming out, we will have our cyclohexane group. And where to put the positive charge for the carbocation? Here's your two choices, right? The two carbons in the double bond. We want the positive charge to be on the most substituted carbon. And it's not necessary to draw, but here's where the H added, at the least substituted carbon. In the next step, that bromide now acts as a nucleophile. So step two, a nucleophilic attack. That means the bromide with its negative charge is going to attack the electrophilic carbon of the carbocation intermediate. And at the end, we've produced the bromide attached to the most substituted carbon from the double bond. Again, this is not a chiral center, so we're not considering stereochemistry just yet, but we will need to, just putting that out there. We are studying what's known as regioselectivity. When I ask you about regioselectivity, you're deciding where does the halogen attach. When you answer that question, where does the halogen attach, you're, you're asking yourself to consider the regioselectivity of this mechanism. And that tells us the regioselectivity, that answer is just form the most stable carbocation. And that will answer, put the positive charge on the most substituted carbon from the double bond and you will have followed Markovnikov's rule. If, remember, that you had an ROOR down here, that if you did, the bromine would attach at the least substituted carbon. So that's just the emphasis of looking at the pure HBr reagent, Markovnikov's rule. 
What if the addition does indeed create a chiral center? Here we have a molecule, you can draw it with me. We have a four carbon chain between carbon one and carbon two is a double bond. So we have one butene. Thinking about that in terms of the mechanism, when this one butene undergoes a proton transfer, that bond collapses, you're going to make the most substituted carbocation intermediate. This carbocation intermediate is a secondary carbocation, but really there is no other choice. There's no methyl or hydrogen shift that is going to create a more stable conformation. Now with this carbocation, it's an sp2 hybridized carbocation. That tells us that it's trigonal planar. And we've emphasized the importance of this molecular geometry many times, especially in the SN2 mechanism, because we have an empty orbital above the plane and below the plane of the actual carbocation. That means you can have a top side or a bottom side attack of the nucleophile. And so you will have a 50-50 mixture of your enantiomers. So you're going to have a 50-50 split. It's just as likely that the nucleophile has a top side attack as it is a bottom side attack to create a pair of enantiomers. To understand the stereoselectivity of hydrohalogenation, we must remember the carbocation intermediate is trigonal planar, meaning that it has an empty orbital above and below the mirrored plane. A 50-50 racemic mixture will occur. The stereochemistry of a carbocation, and just kind of thinking about if there's a chiral center, it will be a mixture. So let's work these out. Predicting the outcome. I have a one, two, three, four, five, six carbon chain. So I have a three methyl, two hexene. Now I know this proton transfer will occur and that happens when the pi bond reaches out for the proton and this bond collapses. Proton transfer, meaning the alkene is acting as a base. And that tells me that the carbocation is going to form at the most substituted carbon. So there's my carbocation. And then the halogen will add to that right here. So now let's decide, is this a chiral center? So we have to decide, are those four unique attachments? One of them is going to a bromine, one to a methyl, one to an ethyl, one to a propyl. Yes, this is chiral, which means we're going to form a pair of enantiomers. So when I draw my carbon chain, there's my carbon chain, six carbons. The methyl could be on a wedge and the bromine on the dash and The methyl could be on a dash and the bromine on a wedge. You have a pair of enantiomers. This is a methyl group on the wedge here. So just know that that's not a hydrogen. It's the methyl group that was originally right here. So a pair of enantiomers have been formed. When I add a cross to make that, that uh, double bond forming the carbocation intermediate, I know the bromine will attach to the most substituted carbon. Then I check to see if that's a chiral center. If it is, you form a pair of enantiomers. If it's not, it doesn't matter. Let's try letter B together. Here I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven carbons in this chain. At carbon number four, we have a methyl group. of a seven carbon chain, so three heptene. And I can see that the HCl, I don't know where to draw, let's do this. 
So I'm going to write 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Carbon number 4 had the methyl, and it's the most substituted, so we'll also have the chlorine add-on as well. Is that a chiral center? Well, when I look at this, I have a 1, 2, 3 carbon chain this direction, 1, 2, 3 carbon chain in that direction, so those are the same. That is not a chiral center. I have two groups that are alike. Since I have a propyl in both directions, I know that that is not four unique attachments, so that is not a chiral center, so I don't need to consider stereochemistry. We made a compound really where you could say you have a four chloro, four methyl, I just alphabetized, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four from either direction, and now it's hept. I do not have a pair of enantiomers. All right, let's try letter C. Here we have a cyclopentane with some methyls coming up here, and then the ene coming off of this branch. The halogen adds to the most substituted carbon. Is this a chiral center? Well, let's see. In one direction, one, two, three, four bonds. This is indeed chiral. I can see four unique groups. And what makes them unique is this direction I have methyls, and in this direction there are no methyls. So that's a chiral carbon. So that means I just have to represent that with a pair of enantiomers, where the bromine could be the wedge and the ethyl group as a dash, and its enantiomer would also form where the bromine is the dash and the ethyl group is the wedge. So a pair of enantiomers formed in letter C. And remember, it's a 50-50 mix, top side and bottom side attack of that carbocation. Let's remind ourselves the importance of forming the most stable carbocation intermediate. They can undergo rearrangement if at all possible they will. If we were to draw one, two, three, four, this would be a compound named 3-methyl-1-butene. Here we would have the alkene acting as a base reaching out to the proton. This is called a proton transfer. This bond collapses and we form the chloride, which then goes on to act as the nucleophile and the nucleophilic attack. When I put the positive charge on the most substituted carbon, I have a secondary carbocation. Look around. Is there a better position for it? This carbon right here is attached to one, two, three carbons, but notice it's also attached to a hydrogen. We will use a hydride shift, and that's exactly what this arrow is showing us. If I move the hydrogen to the electron deficient carbon and trade places to create a tertiary carbocation, it will do so. And so this right here, this arrow, if you remember, we called it a rearrangement a hydride shift. And I turned my secondary into a tertiary carbocation, and now the halogen added to the most substituted carbon in that nucleophilic attack. So the nucleophilic attack then will occur after the rearrangement. Now, when you have this possibility for a rearrangement, you're gonna get a mixture of products. It's just unavoidable. It makes the HX addition only synthetically useful when carbocation rearrangement is not possible. 
So here's with no rearrangement, it forms about 40% of the time. And here's with the rearrangement, it forms about 60% of the time. That's not a very good yield if you're only after one over the other product. And so when rearrangements occur, selecting this type of reagent is not the best idea. And that leads us to talk about ways to prevent carbocations from even forming to prevent rearrangements. And those are all upcoming reagent selections that if I can make, you know, if I have an opportunity to prevent this from rearranging, I might want to use that. So let's figure this out. Let's draw a mechanism for this reaction. I notice that the double bond, carbon one to carbon two. So this would be three, three, dimethyl, one butene. But now all of a sudden, the chlorine added way over here, not even on the carbons that were in the double bond. So that's my clue that a shift has occurred. Notice the halogen is added to a carbon, not even in the original bond. That's going to be your clue that a rearrangement has occurred. So that has to be part of our mechanism. So let's begin, and I'll just start fresh on this slide. One, two, three, four, here's our dimethyl, here's the original double bond. And I'm going to just separate HCl so that you can see the arrow originates at the double bond, the pi bond there, and we have a proton transfer. Proton transfer requires two arrows. Right now, The carbocation that is formed on the most substituted carbon creates a secondary carbocation. Look over, look left, look right. Is there a more favorable position? And the answer is yes. Looking at this position, there's no hydrogens here. These are all methyl groups. And so there's no possible way for a hydrogen to shift, but I can move a methyl group. And that's what happens. This methyl will shift and form. Well, it's always one arrow because the carbocation will not ever rearrange to a more unstable configuration. And so one methyl group has changed position and now here is a tertiary carbocation position. Uh, now we have that chloride that formed and it will have a nucleophilic attack. And just thinking about that position right here, a nucleophilic attack, and we have formed, I'll just keep going down the page. Where the chlorine has added to the carbocation deficient carbon. Now, is this a stereo center is this chiral because if it is I have to consider that and the answer is no I can see two methyl groups right here those are identical meaning that that is not a chiral center so I don't have to consider stereochemistry in that answer so we had a methyl shift in this example Want to try one more together. Draw a mechanism for each of the following transformations. I picked one of these for you to try with me. Why don't you work ahead? I would encourage you, pause the video, give it a try, get all of your mechanism arrows in place, and then turn the video on for a final check. A little sip of coffee while you work. <laughs> We know that in our first step, the alkene acts as a base and reaches out for the proton. This bond then collapses and we form a carbocation intermediate. 
the carbocation intermediate, whoops, that's a straight line, bump, bump, right here. That is a secondary carbocation. Now let's look around. There's no advantage of moving it down to the first carbon because that would make it primary. Not shown, but we know is there is a hydrogen and that definitely has an advantage of shifting. So I'm going to do a hydride shift, a rearrangement. And when this occurs, my carbocation has now turned into a tertiary carbocation. Meaning now when the nucleophile attacks, which would be the bromide in this example, electron rich, it's going to attack the electrophilic carbon. And when it does so, whoops, that's not very neat. The halogen has added on right there. Is this a carbo or is this a chiral center? And I'm just emphasizing we have to talk about regioselectivity, and that's just answering the question where does the bromine attach? And we figured that out to this carbon right here. And then stereo considerations do we have enantiomers forming? And if this is a chiral carbon, we would have to write two pairs of enantiomers, but this is not chiral because I have no point of difference in that cyclic ring. So I do not consider stereochemistry there. How'd you do? Are you getting the hang of this? Well, we're gonna take a break there. That will be our first lesson. We're gonna come back in a second video and talk about three different ways to add water across the double bond. We'll investigate acid catalyzed hydration, oxymercuration, demercuration, and hydroboration oxidation. Those are three mechanisms as adding HOH across the double bond. Come back when you're ready.